The American government used this plane extensively in the 8th Air Force in Eagle War II. This is the plane of the B-24 Lancaster. And, I mean, the B-24 is American plane, the British Lancaster, that bombed the German targets uh, of interest, such as uh, uh, oil wells, uh, oil refineries, uh, facilities that were building airports, uh, building railroads, and we wanted to knock off the infrastructure so that we could uh, get into D-Day, December, uh, June 6, 1944, without the Luftwaffe in the air. <coughs> Cold Burgundy is the name of my book because I was named Burgundy as a code name by the British government after I get shot down. And I'll go into that a little later on. But a long escape, it took me thousands of miles to finally make my way back to England after getting shot down over Germany. Swore to secrecy for 60 years. What had happened is that uh, I had so much information of working with the French intelligence and the British intelligence. There was no American intelligence when I was in uh, France, shot down, working with those governments. And uh, in effect, anybody, a, an American in shot down, eventually had to work with the British intelligence and the French intelligence. I had so much information that if I had ever got captured, I probably could have blown a whole network of uh, French resistance workers. Also, I had a great knowledge of the Holocaust that he had to memorize a lot of information that was given to me by a woman to help me in Paris. But just the point at this point, and what I want to tell you is that the B-17 had 13 machine guns, uh, 50 caliber machine guns. And when we would fly, originally when we flew, we supplied in three plane formations. But we were being attacked by German planes, we could only have three or four machine guns firing at them. So some general came up with a smart idea. Now, actually, he wasn't a general. He became a general later on. He was a uh, commander of, of an airplane to stagger the formations. So he staggered in this, in this, this uh, idea so he could get 14 or 15 machine guns firing at one time. This uh, plane here, I got three of them like this. The, the kids come up and they play around with them. They break my propellers and so forth. Two of them in repairs right now. One is a big one about five feet in the width with the wingspan, and another one's three foot in width. How long do I have here? Well, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we don't have lunch until after 11, so. Okay. Good. So what happened is that the war started when I was in high school. This is a picture of me at the high school graduation. So I'll go quickly with that. And prior to that, what had happened is that uh, we, uh, I had been a, uh, a cadet in the Naval Air Force and after uh, I had joined around January of 42, right after Pearl Harbor. And what had happened is that uh, I had a problem with sight vision. And not that I was colorblind, but I had a color perception problem. And you know, in the Navy, they have all kinds of flags and colors and they discharged me right away. I joined the U.S. Army Air Force right after that. And uh, when I joined, there was 27 of us, right, from the Havel Air This fellow here, Alan Lewis, you probably know from Havel. This fellow here, his name is Valoris. A lot of these fellows that you might know, and you, you can picture me, I'm up here. Uh, we're all 18, 19 year old kids. Never fought, a, never shot a gun in our life. And they call us Bill Hyde, or what? Bill Hyde was going through life. That boy is still alive. I was his commanding officer, and he was the biggest flub up you ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> Today, he's retired as a general. When he made general, I was, had been discharged from the service. I called up the uh, Air National Guards of the Mars. I'd like to speak to General Lewis. So the girl says, may I ask who's calling? I said, tell him it's his commanding officer. I was only a staff sergeant. <laughs> so he gets on the phone with Gerald Lewis. I said, Gerald Lewis, God damn you, Katsaris. <laughs> you my voice right away. We broadcast football for Haverhill High School for 27 years. Anyway, the, uh, 
this is, I have to skip all over because I have to go to the service, I went through my hand and we ended up flock and my mother made a big question for that. Not China, Carolina, and that's cool. Can my crew, can you pick me up? This is our radio man. This is our pilot, bombardier, navigator. He was only, uh, just wasn't even 20 years old when he navigated. I was the youngest there, just turned 18. And uh, that's me right there. This is down in Pyote, Texas. We went from Pyote, Texas. We trained uh, one phase of training there to get accustomed to our crew. Then we went to Delhart, Texas. And we were supposed to go through three phases of training. But what had happened, the, uh, there was a mission in October 43 that we lost 63 airplanes. And there was 10 minutes in the plan. We're talking about Iraq right now, losing six or seven hundred men. We lost that one day. 20% of the planes that came back had collateral damage and could never fly again with more people that were dead or injured. Each plane, 10, 10 men in the plane, 63 planes, 630 men went down. So what they did, they rushed us up. Instead of going through a third phase of training, we were assigned to go overseas. So what happened is we went up to uh, <clears throat> Nebraska and they split our crew in half. One crew took one new plane to go over and the other crew took another plane. The planes were going down so fast and furious, we needed planes over there. So we were flying, flying them over to England. That's not the way we flew to England, we flew in single planes. We went from Nebraska to Detroit. Detroit I, I became the engineer of one plane on the way to uh, overseas. I said, you know, we get an oil leak. I said, to the commander of the plane, he says, uh, so what can I do about it? He said, I got to land in Prescott, Maine. I said, no, you're going to land in Grinney Arabia. I said, he said, why? Because I live 30 miles away. <laughs> Grinney is a man's time. And I don't have to go into Haverhill, get back. We had to get an oil leak, we repeat it, and headed for Gander, Newfoundland. You know, arrived again to Newfoundland, and uh, when I, I was going to the mess hall, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around, and who do I see? A fellow from Haverhill, mm -hmm. Arthur Mitchison. Maybe you know the Mitchisons from Haverhill. One of them is going to run from there, yeah. am I right? Yeah, he grad his son graduated. graduated. Yeah. That's my father and friend. Yeah, I know what yeah. yeah. So, uh, the, the next day from Ganda, we were supposed to take off to go to Prescott, uh, Scotland. The first plane that took off blew up. Now, a lot of people don't remember anybody by the name of Lord Ha. Does anybody know who Lord Ha Ha was? During the war, there was Tokyo Rose, an American, and she'd get on and uh, on the radio and she'd talk to the boys in the Pacific. How they were going to lose the war. And then we had a British ship by the name of Lord Ha Ha who did the same thing for the Germans. And he, he got on the radio and he told us that he knew every pilot was going to fly the plane that day and who was on the plane, how many were going, and they were all going to be blown up. So we had to stand down, looked all our planes over, the next day we took off and nothing happened. But we lost one plane. We arrived in England and I was assigned to the 401st Bomb Group. That was in Dean Thorpe, England. And <coughs> The, uh, the base was in uh, oh, about 90 miles from uh, London, northwest of London. And uh, this is the way I looked the first mission I took on. <coughs> That's a heavy jacket. We found out after flying 60, 70 below zero, we couldn't move around with that jacket because we had parachutes, we had body armor, and we had to wear that heavy jacket. We couldn't do it, so we had to take that jacket off and uh, lay it on the ground in case our electric heated suit didn't work. Then we put that on. <coughs> the winds were blowing 300 miles an hour up there with open windows. So you can see this plane, if you happen to be flying as a, as a waist gunner, the, wind, the window would be open, 60, 70 below zero. You kids have it made, right? <laughs> you know why you haven't made it? Because guys like me, most of them are dead. Well, anyway, 
There were so many losses that they allowed us to, to uh, paint our jackets with all kinds of pictures of girls. And this fellow here is one of the best pilots we had. His name is Biff Fitchett. And you can see he has little bombs in his jacket and showed how many air raids that he was on. And they, we did the same thing with, our, with the nose of the airplane. That's his airplane name. Everybody had a different name. Ours was Manawat. But we lost three Manawats. We lost two of them, then we got another one. The third one also went down. The, <coughs> the big problem happened, and I, uh, I'm a Greek Orthodox, we had to go Greek Orthodox priests. So when they made me uh, my dark tags, they stamped C on it, so all of a sudden I became a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and this fellow was the Catholic priest in, on our base. He did his, became a good friend of mine. Sixty years later, I read a book by a friend of mine who knew him very well. I found out he was from Haverhill, Massachusetts. He never knew that I was from Haverhill. I never knew he was from Haverhill. That's a very guy. If you want to know his name, you got to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where I was flying. I was an engineer, as I told you. I was playing an aerial engineer. But I also love photography. and. Uh, <clears throat> The day that I got shot down, I'm not going to go into all the details of all the missions, but the day I got shot down, I was flying as a, as a photographer in this position, and that was a gun I was firing at. The first mission we were on, the tail gunner got himself in trouble. Uh, we were flying at about 27,000 feet on oxygen, and he had a habit of thrashing back and forth when he was firing it at incoming German planes. And what would happen is that uh, he lost his oxygen mask and I had to go back and help him up. But he came in such a hard time, we were sucking up all the oxygen and we ran out of oxygen and I had a 10 minute walk around bottle I gave him and then we had to run back and forth to the pilot's compartment to fill out 10, <coughs> 10 minute walk around bottles and walk through a Bombay door that was open. The catwalk was just wide. Without a parachute, 27,000 feet up in the air. These are the little things you did. A lot of people didn't know about. I had three types of cameras. And this is only one of them. The K24 is a camera that could take a still picture. Uh, K20 was a camera similar to that and would take the pictures as, as the bombs dropped and how they hit the target and if they hit the target. I also had a movie camera that I would take. Every fourth or fifth plane would have a gunner like myself who volunteered to be a photographer. This is flight to Germany. I was not on this mission, but a friend of mine took this picture and every one of these bombers was an 88 millimeter ACAC at the aircraft on shoot day. You could almost walk in that black stuff there. When you're flying our plane had metal on it. You could take a screwdriver and push a screwdriver right through the, the metal of the plane. And underneath, we could hear the shrapnel hit. It got to the point where I would fly with a, a, a separate flak jacket, not only one on me that weighed 37 pounds, but another one by my feet. <coughs> That's the way it looked the day we got shot down. This is a picture I took with one of those cameras. This is my wingmate here, Triangle S. It was our group. I had is the 8th Air Force, and that was the 6th Wall Squad. And that's as the bombs would be released. See the ball to it there? Would you like to fly on that thing? Can you imagine me being in that? Well, I was one day. <clears throat> the same day that we were flying uh, the first mission, a plane like the German plane like this came by. That's a Falk Wolf 190, one of the elite planes that the Germans had. Can you all hear me all right? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. And <clears throat> he came by, didn't take a shot at us, right by my window, and I gave him a quick burst, and then a whole tail assembly just blew right up. Just like that. It's amazing. He's a guy who never shot a gun before in his life, and it's in a life of death struggle or something like that. 
probably kill that pilot. Who knows? Things happen so fast up there, you wouldn't believe it. This is the ball of terror. One day, see, being the youngest guy in the plane, they put me in that ball of terror. This is the way you flew for six, six, seven, eight, or eight, nine hours, freezing it up. Fifteen minutes before we get to the English Channel, I said to the pilot, I'm frozen to death here, I gotta get out of here. He says, you gotta spend another 10, 15 minutes in there. I said, you better have an ambulance waiting for me, because I'm, I'm, I'm a sick boy. Well, the ambulance came, that's where they put me for two days. Never flew the ball toward here. <laughs> Some crazy kid that flew with us wanted to fly, and he could have it. I stayed there two days. That's the <coughs> Fort Worth Bomb Group bus. Hospital. This is a replica of the big plane that I got. Two fellows from Reading came up to me and they researched <coughs> the plane uh, that we flew in the day we got shot down, and they made that plane from it. It's in repairs right now. But see how it has a triangle S? The S is here, four engines, man of what? They did a good job of it. I'm going to get it back in another week. This is an ME 109. This the second elite plane that the two of us had. Walk 0490, ME 109. Later on, they came up with the first jet plane. I'll show you that later on. When I get shot down, that's the plane that shot me down. This is a raid we went over Berlin. The first day we bombed Berlin, I had to fly with a replacement crew. And that was not in good condition because that night before I was supposed to fly, so we went out and had a good time. Just like you kids, had a few beers. And uh, I don't know what I was doing in the plane that day because that was the first time I flew with a new plane that had a plexiglass window and I was firing it through the window instead of an airplane. Because <laughs> the window looked like a plane coming at you, you know. Usually we had no, no uh, windows so you didn't have that disruption. Well, the, the pilot on this mission had never flown a combat mission in his life. And he was flying about 100 yards be, behind the lead plane. And I told him he better get himself in there because you know, we're in a dangerous position. The first plane that the Germans would attack was the last plane in formation. We used to call it Tail and Charlie, Purple Heart Corner. We could never survive it. And he'd pull it in, and then he'd back out again. So the third time when I told him he better get in, because I could see German planes coming at us, he said, Sergeant, if you don't keep quiet, I'm going to have you court martial and you're back. I said, you better get that damn thing in there. I'm going to come up and fly that plane for you. And then I said that, we were attacked. This fellow pulled that plane in right behind the other tail of another plane. He stayed there, the building him back. We never got attacked again. When I get back to the ground, I was making, giving my Greek prayers. I was a Catholic. <laughs> well, anyway, he came up, tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Sergeant, I want to apologize for what I said to you. I said, I thank you. I accept your apology. Today you became a combat pilot. And he did. Most of those pilots were only 21, 22 year old kids. They were taken right out of high school, trained to be pilots. By the time they were 21, 22, they were flying combat. They didn't last more than five or six missions. It's a shame. That's why. On March 20th, 1944, this is the last mission I flew. I'm skipping over a lot of missions because it'll take hours to tell you about it. Uh, we were supposed to go to Frankfurt, Germany, and the weather was so bad the two planes that took off in our air base collided. We flew up to 30,000 feet. We were just barely skimming the cold front, bouncing all over the sky. And we thought they were going to recall us. But they had to knock off this Falk Wolf 190 factory that was producing 60% of the fighter planes in Germany. And June 6 was coming. And Eisenhower and the, and the the brass one, and all those planes knocked out in the sky so that when they landed in uh, Normandy, there wouldn't be a German plane over there. So we had to go to that target. We flew into France, headed for the target. We were about 15 minutes away from the target. 
when this plane above us came down and almost collided with us. If he had collided with us, we could have taken down six or seven planes. My pilot went into a severe dive, and he went down 3,000 feet, or maybe more, to avoid that crash. You know, it's a triple forces. We were banged up against the side of the wall of that plane, and we couldn't move, we just like this. If we wanted to bail out, we couldn't even get it out parachute to put it on. How he pulled it out, I don't know, but he did. Well, we got back up to 30,000 feet again. He said, can you see any airplanes? There's not an airplane in the sky. So he decided to go to Frankfurt. March 20, 1944, the U.S. Army Air Force, Eighth Air Force claims that we bombed Frankfurt, Germany, successfully. We were the only plane that did it. The other planes were recalled for secondary target, and we had no idea of this. They got uh, radio silence never came to us. Goes to the commander of the uh, lead plane, and then he tells you about it. But we were in di dire straits in that dive, so my pilot never got the recall. <clears throat> we got over Frank, and the weather breaks clear. My bomb there sized the target, and it hits the red on our nose. Ninety percent damage of that of that aircraft. That did a fantastic job. We lost. Two engines, the two inboard engines were blown out by ACAC, these two engines. B-17 could fly with two engines and sometimes with one engine, believe it or not. It would take an awful lot of damage. <clears throat> so, 1,500 anti-aircraft guns were shooting at that one plane that day. 1,500. You saw Schweifert, it looked worse than that. Anyway, we fought the Luftwaffe from <clears throat> Frankfurt all the way to Reims, France. And we ran out of ammunition on this waist gun, this waist gun, and a top turret. And the two guns in the front, the navigator and the bombardier had a fight with it. Then the pilot calls up and he says, the top turret gun had his head blown off and his laying in the bar bay door, his body's right behind us. The navigator's good. How you fellas doing in the back? Well, I had been shot up. <clears throat> the killed gunner was slumped over. He looked like he was dead. The left waist gunner got hit in the neck right here with a 20 millimeter shell. The radio man was hurt. Everybody was hurt. But we were still fighting. So I said, I got to go back and see what I can do with a killed gun. I went back and he was dead. I took over his twin, in, twin machine guns and, and fought off a couple of German planes until I ran out of ammunition. Ran back to the waist. This all takes place in about one and a half minutes. In fact, everything was fast. I got back to the left waist gunner and I, I, I put his oxygen mask back on again. Tied a, my scarf around his neck because he was bleeding. It was so cold, it congealed quickly. We threw him out of the plane. He bailed out. He died two days later. Uh, he bled to death. The navigator bailed out, and he, we don't know what he's done or not, but his parachute never opened. The candle he went down like this, and they saw it coming. The kids on the ground saw it coming down that way. They told us about it later. And in the meantime, the ball turret operator, the volunteer to take my place, was stuck in the ball turret. He couldn't get up because there's a huge gear that made this ball turret revolve and have him come out. And he only had an opening about that big to come out. And he couldn't get it elevated. So the radio man and I now, the only two in the plane, the pilot had given the, the word to bail out because the right wing had caught fire. And the plane could explode any minute, but we got to get him out. We're down there plucking up with our left, left hand trying to get him out. And finally, he opens up the hatch and gets out. In his excitement, he picks up his parachute by the D-ring. The D-ring is what pulls the parachute over. <clears throat> and it blossoms right in, right in front of him. Now he's got to gather that parachute, which was silk pills. That's why you didn't have silk to roll on <clears throat> And when he filled out the plane, the parachute opened. Because it was silk. It was something else that never would have been able to do that. He's still living. Anyway, <clears throat> I took a Five-mile free fall. I jumped out of the plane, 
said my Greek prayers and passed out. <coughs> I didn't open up the pressure until I came very close to the ground. The reason I passed out was not only because of injuries that had been off auction for all that time. It must have been almost two minutes. And uh, I came close to the ground and had a difficulty pulling open my parachute because my whole arm was shot up. And I'd had to reach over with my left arm with like shot arms and had to pray again. The Lord God did me a favor and opened up just before I hit the ground. Within seconds after I opened it up, I hit the ground, which is a plowed field, thank God. But I only broke six ribs, a fractured the left ankle, broken arm, smashed my head open, along with being, I couldn't move at all. My parachute was dragging me along the ground, and this is where I landed, right by this farmhouse. This was the World War I air base. And, <clears throat> This is where we landed. One fellow landed here. That was my bomb in the air. A radio man and myself. And that's how we all landed, right around here. Everyone was captured except the bomb in the air. Get away. That Emmy 109 I showed you from before, that German plane, two of them can climb by. And <clears throat> I thought they were going to shoot me. Instead, what they do, they saluted me. I saluted them back three times. They gave, they gave my position away to the Gestapo, but at least they didn't shoot me. That farm was called the Bone Maison Farm, the good farm. Very nice people owned it. And the World War I Air Base was uh, had a legendary pilot by the name of Georges, going to be a freshman, shot down 53 German planes that day during World War I. The American uh, ace was ripping back to shot down 27. And he got shot down just uh, before the armistice. They never found him again. This is the way we landed. This is a navigator who bought his chute, never opened. Ted Cole, the bombardier, he escaped. That's where I landed. The radio man, he landed right in the German camp. They were just waiting for him as he came down. Jack Crowley, he's a left waist gunner. He lived for two days. And Walter Rush, the fellow that had his parachute blossomed out of the plane, <coughs> he came down so fast, he hit a high tension wire, and he impregnated himself in a picket fence. So the, the Germans picked him up, and they, believe it or not, they saved his life. He was in the Reims Hospital in Reims for 57 days. He became a prisoner of war. With the Stalag 17. You ever hear Stalag 17? The fellow that wrote the book is Ben Felfa. He comes from Maine. Felfa and he were roommates and they were bunkmates. And he's got one of the four books that Felfa printed. He still has it. He was offered millions of dollars for that book. And he's going to, he's not going to do it, he's going to give it to a museum. My Eighth Air Force Museum in Savannah, Georgia, okay. The uh, plane crashed here. Actually, it blew up seconds, a few seconds after we bailed out. It blew up. I'll show you the remains of it after, at the end of this program. I was in that position. Like that, for five or six days, the German Gestapo would come in and question me. They wanted to get all the information they could get out of me. All they got was name, rank, serial number, name, rank, serial number. Two days later, they brought a doctor who wanted to amputate my arm. He was a German doctor, and I wouldn't do it. He came back the third day and he put <coughs> some powder on my arm, my head, my, my body, and he left in disgust. Five days later, this fellow comes walking in with these two men. And I thought they would be German to stop because they had pistols in their hand. I said, oh, well, they're going to give me the business now. And this fellow here, his name, Pierre de Lachet, Frenchman. He went like that to me. I figured I was with the French resistance now. These two fellows immediately walk in the back room where the two guys supposed to be guarding me. They weren't paying attention. They're not living there. All I heard was bang, bang. That was the end of it. 
They took me, put me in a car. We had a firefight uh, with the German patrol. I got shot again right over here. Uh, they got hit a couple of times, but not bad, and escaped. And they took me to this father's home, Rene Felix. His father's name was Jean Jolie. He was head of the French resistance in, in Reims, France. His father was a head of resistance in a place called Chaumes. I got to know every resistance south from Reims all the way down to the southern border of, of, uh, of France. They all helped me that much. That's why I honored them when I wrote this book. Because without them, I wouldn't be alive today. When I went back several years later, they asked me to pose for that picture of that year. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a woman in all that farm. Her husband had passed away. This is the worker on the farm that put me in a wheelbarrow and carried me there. And this is Pierre de Marche, who's one of my best friends. I communicate with these people every day by email. George Lee, uh, he, uh, he arranged to have me operate the uh, Because when they took me to the farmhouse, I was in very, very bad condition. It was about the sixth day now that I was shot down. I had no food, water for six days, no painkillers. And uh, he brought me to the, uh, oh, before that, what had happened is that I was born and groaning so much because of the pain that uh, they got a, they brought in a uh, French woman who talked English and she said to me, John, if you don't keep quiet, we're going to have to tell you over the Germans who are bivouac next door. And I said, well, why don't you get a piece of cloth and muzzle me and tie it in the back of my head, which they did not bid on it all night long so that I, I didn't want to go over the Germans. And the next day, they brought me to a clinic. It was right behind the Reims Cathedral. It was still there. I was glad to see it. <coughs> and there was a Jewish doctor who owned the clinic. And he was hiding in the cell. And operated on me that day. And ran out of anesthesia. And I woke up in the middle of the operation. He had to operate again that afternoon. And that afternoon, he said to the resistance, I put the amputator's arm, and they took the pistol, put it to his head, and they said, no, you know, I'm going to do it. He doesn't want his arm amputated. He'd rather die than have that done. He said, well, I have to have another operation tomorrow. So they offered the third day. I woke up, and I had my arm. So he did a fantastic job. <clears throat> I didn't know he was true. I didn't know he was the doctor. They never gave me the information until years, years later to that he was a Jewish doctor. I mentioned him in a book, his name was Dr. Levy, I don't know why. He's another guy to save my life. That night, that was about eight days, not any water, not any food. I was, I thought I was on my, on my deathbed. Uh, that's, that's the night that my mother and father got the report that I was missing in action. And uh, I thought of them, but I also thought of myself, that the neighbor was that saying that I was lost in the journey. My sister sent a letter off to me. And what happened is that uh, the nurse ran up after I rang the bell with two men, and she said, I can't get you out of here. Beep, 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 you gotta go. So I said, what's the matter? Kid, she says, well, there's a nurse downstairs, a collaborator with the Germans, and she reported that there's somebody in that room it doesn't belong there, and the stop was on its way up there. So they took me and put me in the, in the sidewalk. And this is after the third operation. I'm laying in the sidewalk, I rolled off, and we got a it was Saturday evening, and you can see the German soldiers walking by with their dates, looking at me. They said, well, he must be a drunk, so they left me alone. <laughs> they were in with my Air Force clothes on, all bloody and everything. Never bothered me. So, Two young people came by, a young girl and a young father, and they they took me to uh, the Calvary that I had on the Calvary that I had before. I went by, you know, I was, the one I showed with Dr. Uh, with uh, Jean Jolie. That was a Calvary group, and what happened? They had me there for a couple of days, but. Uh, 
a gentleman walked in, I dressed up in Mufti, and he, he demanded to know who I was, and I wouldn't give him any information, because I didn't know what else, what the term is now or not. Apparently it was a different cell of the British, uh, I mean French resistance, they had no idea of me. And they kept questioning me and threatening to kill me and shoot me unless I gave information. Finally, they brought this Madame Ramboge, the English speaking teacher, and she said, John, tomorrow they're going to shoot you if you don't tell them some information. So I gave them little bits of information that didn't mean much. The major thing I gave them was the fact that if you flew over my air base, it looked like a pistol from the air. At the end of the pistol, you saw three little pawns. Looked like bullets coming out of that pistol. Three days later, they had some radio communication with the British intelligence. They found out it was true, and they were you know, getting ready to release me when Peter Demache walked in, created all hell with those people, and he took me out of there. They brought me to this church on Easter Sunday, 1944, loaded with tournaments. The, the French resistance was very gallant. They took so many chances. For every person like me, myself, they say it, they lost one of their men. That's why I honor them. The things that they did to the American public doesn't realize. Then he took me to his house, and uh, he, was a, he was a baker. He lived in a place called Chamezy, France, which is about 15 kilometers east of uh, Reims. And he had uh, a chicken coop in the back, a little farm, and uh, underneath the chicken coop, he showed me where he had dug a 10 by 10 room. And uh, at least once a week, the British would fly over and drop supplies food, but mostly ammunition, guns, time bombs, you name it. And he had it loaded down with all kinds of ammunition. But one day he came by and he says, There's an American plane that I had intact. And he drew a picture of it. It was a P-51, the newest one we had. He said, what would she, what would she do about it? He said, we got to pull it up. So he took me down there. It certainly was a P-51. I went down to Sulek, got the time bomb. We went back again. He befriended the guard that was over there. And about an hour later, both the guard and the plane blew up. These are little things we did. Now I was working with the French resistance. As sick as I was, this is the only place that I had been in France in like two or three weeks that I got some decent food to eat. And he was trying to get me back into health. But to do it so I worked with him as well. <coughs> what we would do, we'd go up and uh, <coughs> watch for the uh, British airplanes or fly over. They would drop spies over, or they'd try to pick up spies, or they would drop uh, ammunition and so forth. And I, I would stand guard with a little stun gun, and uh, then they, the British uh, plane would never land for some reason or other. If it did, I would, could have jumped on and flown back home, but uh, it never did land. And uh, then they separated. Different parts of the resistance would take their portions. And uh, we did that for about a week. And it got too hot for me there because when you were in a safe house in uh, France, having the resistance help me. You shouldn't be there more than one or two days. And I was there too long. The day before I left, some, somebody gave me away for a $10,000 reward. And they came into the house, this is the way I was the day before I left. I had most of my cash. I'm starting to feel a little better, you see that. And uh, there's Pierre de Marche with one of his friends. Pierre was off in bread delivery, but they picked me up, they picked his wife up and his mother-in-law. They brought us to Reims, France, and went to the Gestapo headquarters, banged me around a little bit, not bad. But they, I could hear his wife screaming in the other room. I hate to say this, but this is what they were doing with her. They took fires, you know, pulling their fingers out to get some information. And outside, they had the cement mixer. They started that Smith mix it so the people outside couldn't hear it. That poor woman suffered for another year and a half in a prison camp. The only reason she lived is because she was an excellent cook. She could bake bread, cakes, and so forth. She was an excellent clerk. 
I could go on to tell you a lot more about her, but I haven't got the time. But she survived, and when I went back to see her, I said, would you do that again? She said, for France, and for freedom and liberty, I would do the same thing again. What got she had, huh? Well, how did I get away? Well, that's another long story to me. Now I'll tell you how it was done. But basically how it was done was the, <coughs> the uh, French chief police of Reims uh, organized some sort of a roadblock. And it was all being transported from one prison in Gestapo's prison to another interrogatory area. Uh, car pulled up, they opened up my door, they shut me out, and they put me in, in the chief's car, threw a deputy chief police hat on me and, and over my shoulders his jacket, and off we went. But it took me an hour to explain how it happened. But that's basically how it happened. And they, uh, I had no identification at that time, so immediately they went out and they made this ID card. And the British knew me by Burgundy, but the, German, uh, the French knew me by Jean Gouard. And Gouard was a famous French cigarette, was lousy, no the smoker. No American the smoker. That was my name. That turned out to be a flawed uh, ID card. And I had a replacing friend in Paris later on. <coughs> They took me to a, a farmhouse, which was uh, about 12 kilometers from uh, west of the Reims. And I was lived in a blockhouse for a couple of days. There was a World War I blockhouse. It was an area where World War I trenches were and all kinds of paraphernalia, World War I. Uh, and uh, the fellow by the name of Bronis lived there. And he said, I, I got to introduce you to something he did. It was a, British bombardier by the name of Jack Hold, who had been shot down two days before, and he had him hiding there. They said, the Germans are going to come looking for you, John, because you created so much problem. So what I want you to know is there's two wells here. One has water. This one is dry. We could see them coming from hundreds of odd yards away from, <clears throat> from the house. When they start coming here, they go right down that well. So, Next morning, that's what happened. We done that well for over an hour while the Gestapo was up there questioning Brodus and never let on that we were down below. And uh, it got so hot we left that night and went to another house in a place called Bourgoin, which is like Frank, it was the Havel from Reims. And uh, the fellow there owned a uh, cocktail lounge and a restaurant. And I stayed upstairs for a couple of days with him. But <clears throat> he's another kind of type of a fellow, a very gallant. And you get to know this pilot, uh, Luftwaffe pilot, that flew this type of a plane. That was an obsolete fighter plane that the Germans had. And his fellow was a colonel in the German Air Force. And he was trying to get him to fly me back to England because he was disgusted with the way Hitler was fighting the war. And he knew the war was over. And but he said, I don't know if I could live much longer because I went through the Civil War in, in uh, Spain. He fought, fought Franco. Then he flew five more years in the Luftwaffe in Germany. And two days later, he shot down by the American pilot. So I never did get a ride in that, in that way. But I think he was ready to take me over. <laughs> These are the things that happened in the war. It gets so hot for me in, in Reims, I had to get out of there. So they brought me down to Epony, France, and from there I ended up in Paris. In Paris I stayed with, in a safe house with a gendarme who had two sets of uh, non-clothes. Gendarmes are policemen in Paris. I walked around in Champs-Élysées like that for two days. <laughs> well, I make a good cop. <laughs> so one day I had to go to the bathroom. They called the Pissoiri. They had it. In those 1944, you had to go to the bathroom, you did it right in, right in the middle of the street. And you could be talking to somebody across the, the board. And this German also walked in and said something about where you want to be lost. So 
So I said, you're not so bad, I walked out of there. <laughs> I never left my, the side of my uh, guy again. The, the police officer was outside. I said, don't, don't ever do that again. You're going to go back for you come with me. But uh, that helped quite a bit. When I uh, got into Paris, and the chief police, it seems as though all the chief police in, in France were part of the resistance. He looked at my farm ID card that I had from Reims, and he said, that's flawed, so we have to give you a new one. So he took me to this Jewish woman who had a Star David on me. And that was the first one I had seen with Star David. And the reason he brought me there is because she was a good forger, she was a photographer, and she made me a new, a new ID card. Uh, <clears throat> But she also spent several hours with me and gave me a lot of information as to who the commanders were of the German uh, <coughs> concentration camps, uh, where they were, how many were there, how many, how many were being killed each day. I had so much information to bring back to the unit, it was unbelievable. And it was all memorized. I, had, I couldn't write it down, had to be memorized. Two days after I had left Paris, they broke the French resistance, the Germans broke the French resistance in Paris. There were still 200 Allied airmen in Paris. Everyone was shot. I got out of there two days before it happened. Talk about luck, huh? If you ever go to the 8th Air Force Museum down in Savannah, Georgia, there's a whole section there called uh, AFES, American Air Force Escape and Evasion Society. And it gives you that whole story. You will never get it in a book. No the American government will, will tell you about it. But the atheists will tell you. I am a member of the atheists. I'm only known, the American government does not recognize people and escape you like myself or the baby. They only give you a number. My number is EE755. Escape and Evasion 755. The British recognize us. The French recognize us, but the American government has never recognized us. That's the way it is here. The longest escape. I told you that I got the name Burgundy from the British. Churchill set up a program called SOE, Special Operations Executive. And what that was, before the Americans got into the war, the British were losing all their good pilots because the Luftwaffe had a lot more pilots, better trained pilots who had been flying in the Civil War and in Spain. And he needed those American, he needed those British pilots back in England. So what he did, he set up three ways of getting these people out of there and get shot down. One was by a plane, he could have landed. The other one was by gunboat. And a gunboat, you go in a gun wheel, and there'd be 27 people standing like this, and he'd pick them up, spies or allied airmen, and they'd, the British would come in at nighttime, as long as, the, as, long as it wasn't a, a moon out, and take them back. I didn't have that occasion. Twice I tried to get my gunboat, my plane, and I never made it. I had to go from uh, <coughs> Paris down to Peru, down to St. Jerome, France. And from there, this is St. Jerome, and from there, I had to climb the Purdy's Mountains. What had happened, the day that they broke the uh, French resistance in Paris, we were supposed to go to a place called Pa, P-A-U, and that would take us, <coughs> and one day we could have been down here into, into, into Spain. Because of the fact that they broke it, we couldn't go through that line anymore. So they, they renamed another line from St. Jerome called Burgundy. They called it the Burgundy Line, named after my code name. And it took us four days and four nights to climb uh, mountains that ranged 12 to 15,000 feet high. And we were dressed up in just civilian clothes. I only had a pair of shoes that was about one and a half, two. Size is too small. I have to cut the size of them so I could walk. I'm still paying my that walk over there, but I made it. <clears throat> anyway, uh, we had no food, no water. Uh, somebody, that, the only thing I did have is somebody gave me a couple of pieces of, of sugar cubes and helped me get over. Get into Spain, find, get into a place called Les Spain, right here. 
And uh, from there, they took us to Andorra. From Andorra, they took us to Alert. They called the Li Liada the Slur. And they put us in prison there. The Spanish government was not at war against us, but they were pro Nazi because the Nazis helped them in the Civil War. And I was dying, I was so sick that the major that climbed the mountains with us contacted the German commander of the prison and told him I have a very sick airman. He has to see a doctor. Went to the doctor. He weighed me, he said, you're, seven, you're 87 pounds, and uh, I have to put you in a dispensary, which would have made me happy, instead of a jail. And, uh, but he made a mistake. He said to me, he spoke to the English. He said to me, did you know that the Allies landed in France and they're going to get, get the S kicked out of them? He said, what did you say? So he repeated it. He said, you know, thought that you made me feel better already. So off I walked, went down and saw the major that told him the story. He got a hold of the command of the base. We were up the Purdy's Mountains climbing when the invasion took place. And I had no idea of this several days later. And uh, two days later, the American embassy in Madrid sent a representative over and took us out and brought us down to Saragossa, where we had our first bath. We stuck. <laughs> but, but everybody was in the same boat, you know. And we, we got out a new pair of shoes, new clothes, and they took us down to Madrid. That's why I call it the Long Escape. Starting from Reims, went all the way down to Madrid, from Madrid, down, all the way down to southern Spain, to La Liga, Spain, and got into Gibraltar, where the British were. And I got the British to help me out. And uh, this is Gibraltar, the way it looked then. And they flew me back even in this plane right here, C-47. So it took thousands and thousands of miles to get back to, to London. I got to London, and uh, when we walked in, there were six Americans that, that were uh, in, uh, in the intelligence uh, office, and they wanted to know who Burgundy was. Everybody that was there was a pilot except me. I'm 20 years old there, about 22, 23, 24. So I stood up, they couldn't believe it was me. So they kept me there for four days exactly. And come to find out that the St. Gerard's uh, Burgundy trip over the Freedom Trail was a difficult and severe uh, way to get over the mountains. The others are moderate, as you can see. This would have been it was difficult to severe. <coughs> but a lot of Americans go there every year and try to climb those trails. And they never make it. They can't do it. You have to have what? You have to have faith. You have to have guts. You have to have ability. You have to know you're going to do it. And you have to have luck. Stop with faith. You want to get freedom? You want to keep your freedom? We can lose it very easily here. If you look at my book, it says, cherish your freedom. All you kids got to work for this because we ain't going to be around much longer. It's up to you to keep your freedom. Believe me, if you're going to lose it one day, you won't believe what it's like. Get locked up for one day and see what it feels like. Well, they had to verify that John was who I was. And they said, you've got to get somebody from your air base to verify that you're John. Sorry, all the people that I knew have been shot down. The only one I knew was Pop Fry. He was the major and an intelligence officer on our base. So they get a hold of Pop, he's a friend of mine. So he came down and he verified that I was John Cassaris. So they finally believed who I was. I had to sign a secret seal. This is the secret seal. See what it says here? It carries a heavy penalty to publish or say anything about what had happened to you. I have not been released from that secret seal. I have been writing. I have been received. Three months ago, they, they re, I received a call and I got the verbal release. Then they said, you got to print your book where you want that for the archives. I said, where's my release? You're never going to get a release in writing. But we're giving you the okay. In the meantime, I had spent 10 years researching and I spent three and a half years writing a book. I had it ready for print. 
but I didn't print it until they said it's okay to do so. So they cut out a few things in the book that I couldn't say, but most of it's in there. And uh, three, three months ago they said it's okay, so I got it printed. This is where Pop Fry had to come in and verify I was John Cassage. Oh, I'm not sure that's his, that's his signature here. They didn't take any chances, huh? <laughs> Over here, this is the Havel Cruises of War. And if you look below, you might know some of these names. And right above him says, Deceased Cruises of War. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they put that in here. Big mistake. And that's when they reported me safe and turned in a neutral country. I was in a neutral country with Spain. One, one mission we were on, uh, we were attacked by a, a plane like this, but we thought it was a rocket. They knocked down two of our planes, and we happened to be on our movie cameras at the time. And we told the, in debriefing, we told the intelligence officer how this rocket came through the formation, knocked the planes down, and came back so fast we didn't know what happened. It immediately took out cameras, developed, the picture of the, the 262 jet fighter. That plane was the fastest plane in the built group during World War II by the Germans. We didn't have a plane that could fight it. The P-51 was the best plane we had. This could fly over 100 miles an hour faster. The only way you could knock it down is when they were coming in for landing because they couldn't stay up in the air too long. You know, when the P 262 was coming in for landing, P-51 would come down and knock it down. But Germans had over 1,000 of these. If, the, if Hitler had listened to his generals, he had that 262 <coughs> jet fighter, he had the V-1 bomb, and he had the V-2 bomb. We didn't have anything like that. He also had occasion to get the atomic bomb before us. But one day we bombed uh, in Belgium, because we knew the German uh, scientists developing the bomb were in the bounce. And I believe that we got off. They lost the scientists that day. I was going to have the atomic bomb before us. <coughs> be speaking German. Hitler was his officers to be speaking German. Because that B-1 bomb, he, he shot over 2,000 of these over London, major cities in London. That was unmanned. That's just a one bomb right there. And you could hear it flying. That was in London when they were doing this. You could hear it going pop, 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 pop. It sounded like a, a lawnmower. And when it stopped doing pop, 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 then you could count one, two, three, four, five. You knew you were alive. If you couldn't count up to five, you would get it. <laughs> thousands and thousands got killed. A lot of people will know that. Right after that, he came up, well, or before that, the British pilots would follow those bombs and they come up high over them, and they keep shooting at them. You can see them right over London. The pilots would be shooting that bomb, and the bomb would explode, and the British pilots, what can I say, have to go right through the debris. So all of them were killed that way, but same people on the ground. This is a V-2 bomb, you couldn't do anything with it. That thing would go thousands of feet high, and come down, and you couldn't hear it. Hitler was a bad man. This was a, I got back home, and uh, this is a telegram I sent from uh, Gibraltar and my folks. I sent it on June 18th. No, that's from London, I'm sorry. June 18th. I got home on July 6th, and my folks had never received that telegram until after I got home. I cut the telephone from New York, and I said, I'm here. He said, where? <laughs> I'm in New York. I couldn't believe it. I got home a few days later, the telegram came in. <laughs> That's the American gun fire. <laughs> I was supposed to go to West Point. I was put, picked to go to West Point, and I wanted want to stay in the service. And I was taken before seven doctors in Boston, they examined me, and they said, you can't pass the physical, so you're not going to go there. So I said, then I want to stay in the service, they wouldn't let me stay in. Then they talked to me about the GI Bill of Rights, and they got me interested in going to college, you know, I found it with the BU, where my granddaughter was growing up. And this is the way they discharged me. 
physical condition with this job. What does that say? P O O I. That's the World War II. When people get out of the service in poor condition, they had to go to their own doctors and get fixed up. So they, there's a lot of hue and cry about the kids coming back from Iraq. They really take good care of it. When I went back to France, these are people who live in Rene Felix's. This is his wife. <coughs> so hate, but the two men that helped me, and Mrs. Demache, the one that was picked up by that with me, and was tortured by the Germans again. I went back and bonded them as much as I could. Very good friends of mine still. So went back to the <coughs> to the uh, farm. There's the lady of the farm that owns it. There's, there's a fellow that picked me up to the wheel barrel that's in the shade. My radio man that just passed away a couple of weeks ago. These are <coughs> awards that were given to Pierre de Maché by uh, Eisenhower. This was given to him by de Gaulle, President de Gaulle of France. And this is the <coughs> FF meant Free French Resistance. That's the Lorraine Cross. French Lorraine Cross. The resistance put a B in it for victory. And when the Allies landed, every French resistance worker had an arm patch. I have Pierre's arm patch at home. I have the Gauls chains. I have this. I got all his paraphernalia that they gave him, all the awards he got. Because his grandson was too young to understand what's going on. I said, give it to your son. He said, no, you're my first son. I didn't have a son when you were here. So you're going to get it. And when my grandson has enough brains to understand what's going on, then you can give it to him. So I have them in display at my house. That's me when I get back to Abel. This is a French resistance of what they gave me. This is my wife and I. Cherish your freedom. And that's what's remaining of my plan. When it blew up, I went back to see the plane. All I could find was this patrol. Any questions? Come on, you ask some questions. What questions do you have? All right. How good was your French go? Speak up loud because I'm deaf. <laughs> How good was your French go into the war? Like but my French, I had high school French, and I could speak better French then than I do now. Because when I got back here, nobody ever spoke French. At least the Greeks spoke, spoke Greek. <laughs> the the Jewish, Jewish people speak Jewish. But the French don't want to speak French. I can't understand that. And there was a lot of Frenchmen in Hebrew. So I lost most of my French. I, I gained it again when I go back. But I got along with Pierre de Maché very well. And all those people, I think, my broken French, they yeah, broke broken English, it worked out well. Anything else? Yes. My husband was in the Second World War, mm -hmm. and uh, they went up in planes, mm -hmm. and they were and, and some Japs came over, mm -hmm. and my husband was in the middle, and two in the side, one on the side, and they shot at them, and my my husband's the only one that was there, the two. Yeah. That happens. Yeah. Look. Yeah. Why am I still alive? And right. My other crewmen yeah. died. Some of them at the age of 19 and 20. I know. And you live with that. From the time you were shot down to the time you wound up back in Haverhill, how long a time span was that? Would you believe it? A little over three months. Oh, yeah. wow. A lot going on three months. Three months. three months of help. But yeah. I'll tell you what, YMCA, the Boys Club, the Boy Scouts, the church, and your family. Big help. Big help. You rely on what you learn in those instances. How glad were you to get back home? <laughs> How glad were you? Yeah, you know, I spoke at a, a school in, in, uh, in Connecticut. There was four, uh, third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders. And when I stopped I, and asked for questions, the kid said, one kid got up and said, how many guns did you have? How big was a bullet? How did you take the bombs out? Did you drop them by hand? Uh, uh, how many men were in a plane? 
He started asking some real great questions. The teacher pops up and says, wait a minute, I got all the questions that I wrote down here I want, I want him to answer. I said, well, what's your first question? What did you ask me? How glad were you? How glad was I? How glad would you be? <laughs> I said, let's go back to the children. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I, I always, for some reason or other, I felt confident that I was going to make it. I had the right people with me. I had the French resistance work. I had the British intelligence work. I don't know where the Americans were, but the British and the French were the ones that pulled me through. A lot of confidence. Did you ever find out what happened to the no, rest? Stand up, so I can hear. <laughs> Did you ever find out what happened to the rest of the men in your plane? Okay. What happened to the rest of the men in the plane? <clears throat> the, the pilot, co-pilot, the bombardier. The bombardier was the only one that was captured. The pilot, co-pilot, was captured. The radio man was captured, and they all threw it off. They spent a year and a half in prison. The uh, <clears throat> four others were dead, and I escaped, and my uh, bombardier evaded. And the way he evaded, he had fractured his, uh, he broke his ankle, and he walked something like 10 or 12 kilometers, and finally had a knock on the door in the house, and happened to knock on the right door, and this old, old woman came out. And she got him a, a doctor to help out. The doctor turned out to be <coughs> uh, a female. And uh, I met up with her years later. We got to be very funny. She became a doctor herself. And her husband was a, a famous uh, liver specialist. She would have been the queen of France if they had royalty in France. He ended up with her. And she nursed him back to health. And he was uh, repatriated by the American government after they had the invasion. But as I said, the only one living today is a Baltimore operator, and he lives up in Wisconsin. Any other questions? Well, I, I'm afraid we have to bring this to a conclusion just because they're ready to serve lunch. But I really, Sorry. really thank you so much. I'm selling the book yeah. if anybody's oh, interested in buying the book. They sell for twenty five dollars. Thank you so much for you know, taking the time to come out to the end.